Good afternoon and welcome to the first uh, of our lectures sponsored by the Institute for Global Security, Law and Policy. Um, it has finally dawned on me what the purpose of an introduction is. It's so that you can settle into your seats, go get refreshments uh, without being rude to the speaker. Um, and for us to test the microphones, which appear to be working. Uh, the Institute for Global Security, Law and Policy was established here at Case Western in 2005. Uh, it is now a part of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center. Uh, it focuses on questions related to uh, terrorism, international conflict and peace, and the balance between security and liberty. In addition to a variety of specialized courses and labs that it sponsors, uh, it also sponsors annually a symposium and a distinguished speaker series, and this is the beginning of the 2007-2008 distinguished speaker series. Um, I want to take the opportunity very quickly to plug an upcoming event. Um, we are co-sponsoring with German Studies and the History Department a free public symposium entitled Terrorism in Europe, the German Autumn of 1977 after 30 years. Uh, that will be a series of films and lectures uh, in the afternoons uh, starting this Sunday, November 4th, uh, running through Thursday, November 8th. Uh, you can find out the details by going to our website, which, from which you can link to the web page for the symposium. And I encourage you to try to attend at least some of the films and lectures. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Ted Gupp, who is the Shirley Wormser Professor of Journalism. Uh, Ted has been an active journalist and teacher of journalism for over 25 years, a former staff writer for the Washington Post and Time Magazine, um, and a writer who has published in any number of other major newspapers and magazines. He uh, is the author of, um, and this is how I first came to, to know him, um, The Book of Honor, Covert Lives and Classified Deaths at the CIA, uh, which was named the Book of the Year by investigative reporters and editors in 2001 and was a finalist for the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize. Um, he's also been a finalist for the Pulitzer in National Reporting and the recipient of the George Polk Award the Worth Bingham Prize, and the Gerald Loeb Award. His biography goes on and on, but I don't want to waste your time. Um, I will tell you that amongst his academic travels, he also happens to be a graduate of this law school. Uh, most recently, he's the author of a terribly interesting and important book that looks at our obsession with secrecy, not only on the part of government, but also um, corporations and uh, educational institutions, uh, called Nation of Secrets, The Threat to Democracy and the American Way of Life. Uh, and he will be speaking specifically about issues of secrecy and national security today. And without further ado, I give you Professor Ted Gunn. How are you all today? I, I don't question your priorities except on a beautiful day like this. What are you doing here? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be understanding. Um, if you should want to slide up, some of you that are way up there, feel free. Don't, you're not obligated to, but uh, it's a small enough group. It would be nice. Um, I want to thank you for the invitation today. Um, it's funny, I graduated, uh, let's see, in 78 which is 29 years ago, is that right? I haven't gone very far, I'm just across the street over in Guilford here uh, in all those years. Um, I can still feel the, the pressure of a professorial finger pointing to me, saying, Gup, yeah, they have standing, you know. Discuss raised judicata, discuss blah, 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 and I would 
shape. And, uh, <clears throat> but I have to tell you that uh, my law degree from here has, has proven to be of immense value. It really has. And I'm not saying that just because I'm here. I, it really um, has proven to be invaluable um, on almost every story I've ever worked on. Um, it's just opened a lot of doors and helped me to understand things that it would have taken me a very long time to understand otherwise. Um, I could talk about secrecy until the buds come up in spring, um, and I don't want to do that to you. So I'll try to limit myself to about a half an hour, and then I want to open it up and have a discussion with you. Um, I will tell you honestly, I, I'm much more interested in what you are thinking about with regard to the subject than what I already know. Um, I have to sing for my lunch. I have to tell you what little I do know. But in return for that, I hope you'll share with me your thoughts and concerns. Um, and if you want to interrupt me before I conclude, please feel free, OK? Uh, I, would, I would welcome that. I'd like this to be a discussion. I hope it degenerates into a, a town meeting or a discussion rather than a monologue. Um, I, I really, my big thrill was being able to write this on the board. You can see that I'm old school, not very high tech, but it, it's always been my dream to be able to return to the law school with a blackboard and draw something on it, and here I've gotten to do it. Um, <coughs> I, I want to talk about secrecy and security. That's the subject. Um, and it's a difficult subject. It sounds easy, but it's not quite as easy as it may sound. And um, it's difficult for a lot of different reasons. Um, there are a lot of people out there that get quite hysterical about the subject. Um, and uh, I'll try not to. Um, it's hard to quantify secrecy. There are numbers, um, and the numbers are fairly reliable. They come to us from the federal government. But even they are a little suspect, uh, as you might well imagine. But let me try to give you a, a sense of the, the scope of secrecy. Now, the figures on the number of secrets, the number, this is not really the number of secrets, the number of times that the stamp of secrecy has come down in a given year since 1997 has much more than doubled. The government's figures show that in 2005, the U.S. brought down the stamp of classification 14.2 million times. Now that's 39,000 times a day, or 1,600 times every hour of the night and day. And four out of five of those documents were classified secret or top secret, as opposed to confidential. Now we're talking about a kind of tsunami of secrecy. It's virtually unimaginable to try to get your arms around the mass of secrets that we have now. And I would bet that of those 1,600 secrets per hour, not one will tell you where bin Laden is hiding or where he may strike next or any one of a number of very pressing issues. And I think it's fair to assume that there aren't 1,600 really good secrets that come into our possession even on our finest hour or day or week or month. And that raises the question, well, exactly what are these things? that are being classified. Uh, I should tell you right up front that I'm a defender and supporter of secrecy. I am not, um, don't let this little earring fool you here. Uh, I believe in a strong military. I believe in a strong CIA. Please. That's fine. Excellent question. Excellent question. The question is, what does that 1600 really mean? And, and the answer is, and, and you cannot avoid nuance or complication in this area, so I'm really delighted you asked the question. It doesn't mean new secrets. There are two kinds of secrets. One is original classification authority. The other is derivative. Derivative tracks the flow of existing secrets, so that if you have a document that includes a secret, it becomes classified, and that's one of those stamps of secrecy. The vast majority of that 1600 per hour represents derivative classifications. And one of the things that spawned that tsunami is the internet that the military uses. Because it used to be they'd get on a stew, a secured telephone unit, and talk on the phone. That wouldn't generate a classification. But if you send an email, it does. Does that answer the question to some degree? 
Yep. I thank you for asking. Okay, I'm assigning you to keep me straight today, okay? That's a good question. Thank you. Um, to manage this amount of secrets, you need a lot of people because you need classification in order to be able to gain access and to handle them. We don't have the bodies to throw at this number of secrets. So there is a queue of people waiting for security clearance. That queue, if it lined up at the Pentagon, would stretch to Richmond 100 miles away. There are an estimated 325,000 people waiting for security clearance as we speak today. And the average wait in that queue will be about a year. The cost of managing and maintaining those secrets, according to the Information Security Oversight Office, which is a part of the United States government, is about $7 billion a year. That $7 billion goes for safes, it goes for shredders, it goes for chemical disposition of documents, it goes for training of classification people, background checks and clearances. $7 billion, to put it in perspective, is about the budget of the entire budget of the Environmental Protection Agency. So secrets do not come cheap. Now, I want to try today to offer an explanation as to why we have so many secrets now. We've had secrets before. We've always had secrets. Every nation has had secrets. But why so many secrets now? And that, this little primitive thing up here, is my feeble attempt to explain it. And I will go through this. Now, we start here with the natural impulse. That is, everything on this side is pushing towards secrecy. And everything on this side is a check or balance against excessive or obsessive secrecy. That's why the arrows are headed this way and that way. OK, so let's start with this one, natural impulse. It's a simple fact of life that everyone who has power gravitates towards secrecy. Almost everyone that has power does not invite accountability. They do not like to be held answerable. Even Lyndon Baines Johnson, who signed the Freedom of Information Act in 1966, basically held his nose before he signed it. He didn't want to sign it. He was pretty much coerced. If you want to find a politician who supports transparency, find one who just retired or was defeated, because that's about the only kind of politician that supports it. So natural impulse always pushes towards secrecy. 9-11 does not need a lot of explanation, but we are going to elaborate a little bit on its impact on secrecy. But 9-11 turned out to be uh, a sort of accelerant in the hands of an arsonist. That is, added to the natural impulse, it fueled a massive expansion of secrecy. And we'll, we'll look at how that played out. I would argue this is not a Republican phenomenon. It is not a Democratic phenomenon. It has nothing to do with partisan politics. It has to do with power. And it has to do with the checks on power or the absence of those checks. It is not unprecedented in the sense that we've always had secrets. But the scope and dimension of the secrecy may very well be unprecedented. So, you know, if you look at, at the fires in Southern California, hell of a transition, eh? If you look at those fires, you say, well, why are there so many fires? We had an arsonist. Well, that doesn't explain it alone. You also had the Santa Ana winds. You had a drought preceding it. You had a confluence of events, and in the prevailing cliche of the day, you had a kind of perfect storm set up. That's exactly what you've got in the realm of secrecy today. You've got a perfect storm. You've got a confluence of events which together have conspired, the events, not the people, to create uh, an explosion of secrecy. 9-11, let's look at that first, really redefined issues of secrecy and national security. You've heard 9-11 changed everything, but indeed it did. In what way? Well, specifically, the traditional domain of secrecy was the military, the Pentagon, and the 16 entities that come under the rubric of the intelligence community, the CIA, the DIA, the service branch intelligence units, etc. But 9-11 changed the meaning of security and the scope of it. 
because we went from a military target to a target of civilian infrastructure. Now, you all know that. You know that the buildings that were hit, with the exception of the Pentagon, that the towers were civilian targets. But the implications of that are far-reaching because suddenly everything became a target. Our entire infrastructure, bridges, airports, highways, railways, ports, chemical storage units, nuclear power plants, electrical grids, everything became a potential target. And because of that, the notion of secrecy that had been attendant to security issues migrated along with the new definitions of targets so that all the entities that came in contact with these infrastructure targets suddenly became dragooned into the net of security and secrecy. All of the utility companies became deputized to handle issues of secrecy. The power plants, the electrical grids, the highways, the ports, virtually everything that moves and makes in this country came under the broad rubric of security. And with that migrated secrecy. And it created a new paradigm. We moved from a culture that talked about the right to know to a culture that focused on the need to know. There was a paradigm shift, to use that cliche. There was a requirement that we justify our knowledge and our access to information because each bit of information posed a potential threat, exposed a chink in our armor, potential vulnerability with regard to vital infrastructure. That's 9-11's impact. So we've, we've talked about two of these three entities up here. I want to look at this one for just a minute, the unitary executive. That's an exotic term, um, but it also, like the Santa Ana winds, whip the fires of secrecy dramatically. This term, unitary executive, unitary taken by itself is not uh, an exotic word. It means one, single. Executive means just what it says, executive, single authority. And, but it's how it's applied in this context. And for this, I have a little button, and I took it off earlier but I can at least show you. Let's see here. Ah, here it is. Somebody gave this to me at the University of, of, uh, Indiana, of Indiana University some time ago. It says, history is everything. To understand the unitary executive, you have to go back to the 1970s. There were two major events then which set in train these things. One was Watergate, which spawned a slew of reforms. Whenever you use the word reform, you're well advised to put in quotes. But they were widely touted as reforms. And what they did, to some significant degree, was they cut back on the authority of the executive office and enhanced the oversight to which the president was, was held. And so the Watergate reforms reduced the stature of the presidency in the eyes of some. The second event was a series of hearings into the CIA and alleged and confirmed misdeeds, attempted assassinations, coup attempts, um, all kinds of, of shenanigans. And they spawned the church hearings and the Pike hearings. And what that did was it dramatically curtailed the CIA's activities and created oversight over them which further reduced the potency of the presidency because the CIA is the unseen arm of diplomacy, the hand, the fingers, the tool of the president. Contrary to what you've heard about this rogue agency, it operates entirely at the mandate of the president of the United States. The CIA does almost nothing of a major way without his authorization through a finding a directive. So you had a double reduction in the stature of the Oval Office. Now, among the people that were deeply concerned about these two developments were two folks in particular who were extremely patient, very bright, and willing to bide their time. 
One of them was Donald Rumsfeld, and the other was Dick Cheney. And they both felt that the presidency had been diminished way beyond what, should, what was contemplated in the Constitution. And they waited and waited until the presidency of George W. Bush to help push the pendulum back to where they thought it should be, a greatly empowered presidency. And that is the unitary executive. Now, why is that pushing towards secrecy? Well, because if you believe in an empowered presidency, what is the quickest way of neutering or disabling opponents or those who would meddle? Secrecy. You starve the opposition of the oxygen of information, and you control them. And that is the role that secrecy plays with regard to the unitary executive. If Congress doesn't know what's happening, it can't conduct oversight. If the public doesn't know, it can't get involved. If the courts don't know, secrecy is a very powerful instrument in the context of the unitary executive. Okay, so what I want to do now, I'm going to take my jacket off if I may. What I want to do now is, is shatter a few myths, and then I want to talk about why it is that we have so much secrecy, because we have all these safeguards, right? The first thing that I would say is that the current situation has rendered us vastly more vulnerable. That is, obsessive secrecy has not made us safer. It has put, her at, put us at greater risk, much greater risk. The idea that somehow the more secrets we have, the safer we are, is a canard. And people who really study this stuff, I think, will tell you so. And I will, I will cite a few examples. The central lesson of 9-11, as espoused by the 9-11 Commission, was not that we didn't have enough information to thwart the attacks, but that we didn't share the information we had, that we didn't connect the dots. It was generally regarded by the Commission, which was bipartisan, as a failure of connectivity. That was one of the central findings of the Commission. And so they attempted to foster what they call an information-sharing environment. That environment has not come into being for the reasons that I'm going to cite in a minute. What we're dealing with is a culture of secrecy. The folks at the CIA hate that term. They will tell you they do not have a culture of secrecy. Now, I will tell you they do. Um, and and uh, for example, if you work at the CIA, um, and it was founded in 47, 1947. Usually you meet your spouse at the CIA. So you marry someone who's at the CIA. And if you want to go to a social event, you can mix with ordinary folks, but you have to be constantly on guard. Questions that they ask could unravel a cover story. So you're naturally going to gravitate towards your own people because you don't have to be on guard. They know what questions to ask and what not to ask. And if you have kids and they grow up and they're teenagers and they reach their early 20s, one of the most common places they work for a summer job is the CIA. And we now have instances of second and even third generation CIA employees. It has emerged into a culture. Is that a bad thing? I'll leave that to you, for you to decide. But it has ramifications because the first generation of CIA was civilian, lawyers, doctors, scientists. They were rooted in our community, and they had and shared our values. But the CIA today is highly professionalized after three generations. The top is. The bottom that's out in the field is greener than ever. More than half the people at the CIA today were not at the CIA when George Bush was sworn in his first term. So you have a highly professionalized group at the top and a very green group in the field the operatives. Um, I want to tell you just a few things about the culture of, of secrecy uh, because I think it helps explain this. If you work in government and you have a pile of documents on your desk and you've got to figure out, well, what am I going to read first? And you have documents that are marked nothing, they're not classified, and you have documents marked confidential. The documents marked confidential will go on top of the unmarked documents. If you have documents marked secret, they will tend to go on top of the confidential documents. And if you have top secret documents, they will command 
even more attention. And if you have sensitive compartmented information, code word only documents, you will naturally gravitate towards those first. People in the bureaucracy know that. So if you write something and you want it to get attention, there's an impulse to classify. No one has ever been penalized for overclassification, but people have been taken to the woodshed for underclassification. There's no reason not to classify if you're within the bureaucracy. When you have access to such documents, you are in the loop of power. When you do not have access to such documents, you are marginalized. You do not have access to power. Obviously, you want to be within the loop. Um, the higher the classification, the more authority it confers upon the author. If you generate a document of the highest classification, it reflects a certain standing in the intel community or military community. Um, <coughs> now, I told you before that we needed to go into this uh, information sharing environment. You remember that after post 9-11? And there was a lot of talk about it, but the truth is that it was unfunded. It had one staffer, and the first director of information sharing left because he got no support. All he got was, was rhetoric. So, uh, I want to read to you two, two things here. One, very briefly, this is, um, traditionally secrecy has been vital to effective intelligence. But now, secrecy is causing some of our most significant intelligence failures. That's this one sentence from this. Um, let's see. Um, secrecy rules almost always make it harder to use the information that is being protected. Um, on and on and on it goes. This is a document from one of the most conservative institutions in America, the Hoover Institute at Stanford. This is not some left-wing organization. This is a conservative organization. This was their conclusion studying the problem. Let me quote you from a congressman, a Republican, in a hearing, the title of which, this is the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats and International Relations. The title of the hearing was Too Many Secrets, Overclassification as a Barrier to Critical Information Sharing. Here's the quote. As a result, no one can say with any degree of certainty how much is classified, how much needs to be declassified, or whether the nation's real secrets can be adequately protected. In a system so bloated, it often does not distinguish between the critically important and the comically irrelevant. That's Christopher Shays, a Republican member of the House of Representatives. This is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. It's an American issue. Okay. So. We're making good headway. The end is in sight, and we'll open it up then. There's a cachet about secrecy. If you look down the street and you see an armored truck coming down, what's the conclusion that you reach? You conclude there's something inside which is of value, right? Why would you have the armor if there's nothing in there of value? And much is the same with the psychology of secrecy. When you have information which is protected, the presumption is that it's of enhanced value. But there's another reason why information is protected. You remember the boy in the bubble whose immune system was compromised? He was protected as well. He was protected because he lacked the ability to fend off infection. And it's the same in secrecy oftentimes. That sometimes information is protected not because it's valuable, but because it cannot withstand scrutiny. And those who possess it have an agenda and do not want it subjected to scrutiny. We think of secrets as being more credible because they're protected. Oftentimes, in fact, they're less credible because they've never been exposed to the pull and tug of open debate and scrutiny. And this is an ongoing problem in the security establishment. Um, <coughs> I want to just give you two quick examples of, of um, abusive secrecy. The CIA um, has, has um, 
successfully fended off an effort to declassify the oldest classified document in the U.S. archives. It dates back to 1917. It's the formula for invisible ink that uh, the Kaiser used in World War I, um, claiming that it might compromise the agency's ability to communicate. That's an interesting one. Now let me give you another example of abusive secrecy um, that goes the contrary way. In 1991, a gentleman in Iraq buried documents, blueprints for a centrifuge, which is a key step in, in making a nuclear weapon. And when the Gulf War started, he brought these documents forward and shared them with people in government, the U.S. government. The U.S. government was very eager to establish Saddam Hussein's intent to reconstitute a nuclear weapons program. And they were gleeful to get these documents, even though they dated back to 91, because at least they showed some intent, albeit dated. They were so gleeful, they put it on the government website of the CIA, these documents. And when people in the weapons labs of the United States, like at Los Alamos, read them, they said, what in the hell are you doing? What are you thinking? These are highly sensitive documents. They remained there for weeks and were downloaded around the world, including in Pakistan, we know. And finally, when they were confronted about this by journalists, they took it off with the explanation that it had been up long enough. That, perhaps, is understatement of the year, long enough. Now, there's a very famous expression by, by McGeorge Bundy who said, if you guard your toothbrushes and your diamonds with equal zeal, you'll lose fewer toothbrushes and more diamonds. That invisible ink was a toothbrush. Those blueprints for the centrifuge, those were diamonds. And it's what happens when you have an explosion of secrecy. You lose track. You become desensitized. You create a society which is contemptuous of secrecy because they see it abused. All right, now what I want to do is address these things over here, and then I'm done. Okay, we're going to start. Um, if you have trouble hearing me, let me know, okay? With the exception of 9-11 and unitary executive, we've always had national impulse towards secrecy. But we've had these to protect us from excessive secrecy, right? So let's look at these. Uh, I think. All right. So let's go to Congress first. Congress is one of the traditional breaks on excessive secrecy. It has an oversight function. But for years, we had one party dominance in Congress, the Republicans. The Republicans were derelict in oversight. They held few hearings. The hearings they held related to secrecy were often closed door, and nothing came out of them. There was no oversight during those years. And the Democrats were at least as AWOL as the Republicans. They were terrified to challenge the administration for fear that they would appear to be unpatriotic or weak on defense. And so you had essentially collusion between Republicans and Democrats in scrapping hearings which would otherwise have been held. So Congress basically took a trust me attitude. No oversight, we remove that break. But let's go to the courts and law. Well, first of all, the courts, the Supreme Court, has a different composition. Alito, Scalia, Roberts, Thomas. That notion of unitary executive has a nice ring to them. A nice ring. And people in Congress, in the press, and elsewhere in society are very reluctant to take issues of excessive secrecy all the way up the chain of the courts because they're deathly afraid they're going to establish an adverse precedent with that composition on the court. And so much of this did not go challenged there. Um, we're going to take this out. And not to mention um, the, the suspension of habeas corpus, Guantanamo, rendition, the invocation um, repeatedly of the secrecy uh, document, state, state secrecy, U.S. v. Reynolds, which is a case that I commend to your attention. It's the bedrock for, for, for uh, invoking secrecy in this country, and it's a sham case, if ever there was one. I interviewed um, someone who was a party um, in that case, and uh, it's deeply disturbing. Um, it's the case that's cited whenever the government says, you can't conduct a hearing on this because it will expose national security or compromises. And I, I'm going to erase law 
And forgive me for doing that in law school. I know that may offend some of you. Um, but I'll tell you why. And I, I don't think I'm being unduly cynical here. Um, but I do engage in realpolitik, and my life as a journalist, um, I don't look through rose-tinted glasses, to put it mildly. Um, one of the things that I have come to conclude is that as much as I cherish the law, the law is often predicated to a disturbing degree on the exercise of good faith by those under the law. And that if those subject to the law in government do not act out of good faith, but are contemptuous of due process and of the courts and of the laws, and if you have um, a Congress which is intimidated, and we'll get to the other entities here, that law can be effectively neutered. And there are many instances of it. Um, the Freedom of Information Act was essentially eviscerated uh, early on by the Attorney General, John Ashcroft. He reversed the polarities of presumption in that, in that bedrock law, basically sending out a green light to all agencies and departments in government. If you don't want to hand out information and it passes the straight face test, the Justice Department will back you up. And it, there, are, there are many, many examples of that. Now let's go to the press, because we could always rely on the press. No. And why not? Well, first of all, because in the aftermath of 9-11, a lot of journalists were also afraid of appearing to be unpatriotic. And so they pulled their punches, not for a day or a week, but for years. And they basically um, bought the party line. The weapons of mass destruction was not an issue of Judith Miller alone. It was the entire New York Times and much of the major press. And in fact, the editor of the New York Times editorial board uh, has said that the biggest regret that she has during her five years as head of the New York Times editorial board is that she never questioned the existence of WMDs and that she ignored the skepticism of others on the board that voiced skepticism, which is amazing. Because if there's one time to be skeptical in the life of a journalist, it's issues of war and peace, when we put our young men and women in harm's way. So we're going to take the press out of this mix. I think you're getting the picture here. And now we come to the Vox Populi. I had to put it in Latin because I endured nine years of Latin. And so, you know, you don't get every opportunity to, to display it. Um, so the voice of the people, that's you, the citizens. And 9-11 scared the bejesus out of the citizens of this country. Uh, one person that I interviewed who's at the Congressional uh, Research Service, who's a specialist in secrecy, he said that he felt like he was watching beetles rolling on their backs with their legs up in the air. Uh, that was his description of American citizenry post 9-11. Not a very flattering portrait. Um, why have we not heard more from the public about the extensions of secrecy, about the engorged executive office, the diminution of Congress. Why have we not heard more? Um, and there are many answers. Some of them are more complicated than others. I think that we could change that overnight with one word, and that, or two words. If, I, if you allow me an article, that would be the draft. Um, but we don't have the draft. Um, I think that, that to a large degree, the notion was, keep me safe and don't tell me how. This was not a secrecy that was resented, it was almost welcome, because I think it salved the conscience. You know, there, there, were, there was a famous expression about how those who would trade uh, uh, security for liberty deserve neither. Uh, and we've heard a lot about the evils of appeasement. But in a sense, we have adopted a policy of appeasement in giving up a number of civil liberties for the illusion of, of additional security. And I would definitely argue that what we've given up has not given us anything in the trade in terms of enhanced security. Um, I'm going to take this off because we still haven't heard from the people. This last week, by the way, was a national week of demonstration against the war. There was nothing in most of the papers of the country. I think the largest demonstration was in Boston. I think it was 10,000 people that got back page coverage. That was it. Um, and then we have history as a corrective. What do I mean by that? Well. When people delve through history, they ultimately find out what our government did. And people know that. If you're literate, you know that ultimately what you did may surface. 
And that is a kind of corrective on, on governmental activity. Because people, if they think that ultimately they're going to be held accountable, even if it's years later, they don't want to leave a solid legacy. However, our access to history has been dramatically impaired. The Presidential Papers Act has been changed so that families now have additional control over when those presidential papers are released. The Freedom of Information Act, I've already mentioned, has been largely eviscerated. Documents were vetted from the United States archives. Um, Fruce, the foreign relations of the United States, the official diplomatic history of the United States, is subject to the, what the CIA wants to release, and it's released from its nothing. So they don't have to worry about the hand of history anymore. Whistleblowers, those are the internal people of conscience that put their careers on the line to step forward and say, I see something wrong. But if you look at what's happened to whistleblowers, over the last eight years, you'll understand why we don't have more whistleblowers. You know, we have a woman named um, Sybil Edmonds at the FBI that came forward and, 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 and told her superiors that the inadequacy of translators in anti-terrorism at the FBI exposed us greatly. And she was fired. And the subsequent hearing of her case was closed to the press the invocation of secrecy that U.S. v. Reynolds, which is a bogus case itself, um, and if, if anybody wants, we can discuss that, that particular case. But whistleblowers have basically been, been uh, uh, so um, dissed by the system that they know not to come forward by and large. And indeed, the chief person to protect them, the Office of Special Counsel, is such a loyalist to the Bush administration that whistleblowers don't take cases to them anymore. Um, so the whistleblowers are not exercising that restraint that they once did. And finally, we come to regulation, deregulation. Um, the massive deregulation that's occurring in the country now is reducing the amount of reporting and the amount of information available, which is an oblique way of saying it's enhancing secrecy. You know, there was a little article in the New York Times today about the woman who's head of the Consumer Product Safety Commission was one of the most bizarre stories I've ever read. This is a woman who heads a federal agency who's pleading with Congress not to double her budget, not to give her more authority to crack down on abuses in the consumer realm. Why? Because she doesn't believe in that kind of regulation, and she wants it to remain weak. Reporting requirements have been reduced. Information availability has been reduced. And so what you've got is fewer and fewer checks on secrecy. And I'm going to remove this wall because I don't know anything that's holding it back, to be honest with you. Okay? That's where we are. Now, what I gave you just now is a gross oversimplification, a compression. Um, I think it has some merit. There's a lot of opinion in what I said. God knows I can be wrong. And I'm happy to be challenged on it. Um, but that's just an overview. So I'd like to open it up now for a discussion. Okay, um, you were saying about the Vox Populi that uh, that you have not heard from the American people. Okay, um, haven't the American people spoke loudly uh, as to what they they prefer um, by all of the uh, demonstrations for for peace that have have come out? And is it, isn't it true that the majority of the people have, have spoken out against this war, but that, uh, but that the, the voice of the people who, that has been spoken loudly has, doesn't get, get a chance to, to be heard or, or to be acted upon? The, the, the latest number that I have, this is from, uh, um, I, let's see, this is from today. Um, 26% approve of the way the president is handling the war, and 67% disapproved. So you, you have essentially two-thirds disapproving. But this is in response to a poll. Disapproval in response to a poll generates no political momentum. I mean, if that's all you had during the Vietnam War, um, we would still be over there probably. I mean, there, there aren't the feet on the street. I, I'm sure you're right that people do not support 
the war. But that doesn't generate the kind of political capital to dissuade people who are so firmly convinced of the rectitude of their positions. Um, and it doesn't expose others in Congress to the belief that they're living on the precipice, politically speaking. Uh, uh, I mean, it's easy to check a box on a poll or to respond to a pollster and say, I'm for or I'm again. Uh, but that that's not a high enough voltage, I think, to change foreign policy. Um, and I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I think, to be honest, I think one of the central questions that keeps me awake at night, if I'm allowed to say that, um, I, a few years ago, in 2003, I was at, at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government for a, for a semester. And we had this parade of really smart people come through there talking about different things. And I asked every one of them the same question, which was, you champion democracy. You do not champion elitism. You talk about your respect for the citizenry and their role in a democracy. How do you reconcile that respect with what you see in terms of silence now? And I never got a good answer. I never got a good answer. Um, there's a long history of, of, of political theorists that try to deal with the issue of, of respecting the citizenry um, in the abstract and reconciling that with the conduct in the concrete. It's a difficult question. And I, 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 I fear that I haven't met your question full on, but I, I think that's the best I can do on it. Uh, go ahead and get into Reynolds a little bit. I agree that the underlying facts of Reynolds are somewhat um, challenged and probably successfully that they were uh, a little bit weak in terms of what we were employing in terms of needing secrecy for the plans, the planes. Um, if, if we were to change the Reynolds rule, the rule that came out of Reynolds, so, uh, how would you change it and um, if you would change it? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, I'm sure that there are people in this room that are a greater authority on Reynolds than I am. But I, Reynolds is based on a case about a B-29 bomber that crashed in 48 uh, in southern United States. It was on a peaceful mission. It had civilian engineers on board. Everybody was killed. And the widows of those engineers sued the federal government. Um, and the case um, was thrown out because the government said that releasing information about the flight would compromise national security. The implication um, was quite clear that there was all kinds of classified activity involved or highly advanced avionics uh, and that we couldn't compromise um, with the release of information, um, anything about the flight. And the daughter, seven weeks old she was when her father was killed on that flight, years later, decades later, was online um, to surf in the web and discovered that the report about the flight had been declassified. And she went and got a copy of the report. And to, and I don't think this is too strong a word, um, I think it's the word she used, to her horror, she found that there was nothing classified about the flight at all, but that the report contained information that said that the plane had been very poorly maintained, suggesting that it had contributed to its crash. And she felt that the government had basically defrauded the widows, had lied to the widows in, in invoking state secrecy and national security when in fact it was a simple maintenance issue. And so she brought an action. And this was just a couple of years ago. She brought an action. And correct me, please, I have enough lawyers in the room, you know, don't stand on ceremony, feel free to correct me. But my understanding is that her action was also defeated when the Solicitor General of the United States, Ted Olson, um, acknowledged that there was nothing secretive that he could find about the flight, but defended his, the decision saying, but there could have been. And that is not the strongest basis that I know of for invoking state secrecy. Um, there are real reasons to invoke state secrecy, but they should be predicated exclusively upon a showing of grave national harm and nothing less because otherwise you paralyze the entire judicial process, which is exactly what you've done. People that have been um, um, uh, rendered, extraordinary rendition, 
taken overseas and tortured. Um, they can't hear their claims uh, because of Reynolds and the invocation of state secrecy. I think that's a travesty. I think it, it undermines faith in our whole system. Um, and I've talked to some of those folks, um, and they, they feel as though our system is bankrupt. Um, and it's hard for me to come up with words of, of comfort or consolation given what they've endured. Um, so that's my take on, on that case. Is there anybody that wants to, to uh, elaborate on that case or, or counter or, or uh, oppose what I said about it? No. Okay. Please. Uh, does Hamden versus Rumsfeld uh, set an, a, a new uh, precedent or, or, or stare de decisis in, in this, uh, as, as opposed to Reynolds? And in what way? Um, well, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's because um, the, uh, um, there, there was a decision made by, by the court that that, that a person uh, could could have have you judicial re review and, and and face the charges, right? That's my understanding, but I I, mean, I, ha I haven't read the case in a long time, so I'm not, I don't feel comfortable discussing it. Except that it also involved a good bit of invocation of secrecy. Um, there there are no cases that I know of that have really been able to proceed to the merits, at least that I know of. I think they've all been stymied. Um, is there uh, any other uh, no other questions, comments, thoughts? Okay. I, I'd also like to hear. If, if, if can I just ask you to hold for one second? Can I ask you? you know, were you in one of the branches of service, or were you? W which one? Air Force. And what was your military occupation? Weatherman. Okay. And how did your experience square? I mean, I, I, do you mind terribly? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'd be interested in knowing. If you're working on SIPRNET, which is the classified Internet, essentially, right. and especially if you're dealing with emails, you just have the option of classifying things. And it's, I mean, it's just natural with the trend of email. You've got a whole chain that goes back and forth, back and forth. So even if what you're discussing could be, you know, let's grab lunch, down that chain or just because the code word and whatever right. you discussed, somewhere in there, there's classified material. And this, there's a huge proliferation of things that are marked secret electronically just because of that, or they're on the classified network and therefore right. has some level of classification. So I mean, my experience, mostly related to operations, a lot of what we're dealing with had very reasonable need to be classified. There are methods, sources being protected, right. ongoing operations. But at the same time, I know people in military graduate schools where they will do everything they can to avoid writing a classified thesis because it's just at hours to their workload so they can only write it in certain secure areas right. and they need to get on specific networks. Everything they do is protected. And there's a, and don't forget your question. Okay. There's another thing that this opens up to and that is the, the use of technology in secrecy because we all think of the information age, but the information age has spawned the security age as well to counter the potential for loss through, through, through computers and internet. Uh, for example, I, I had a four-star general tell me that that it used to be that when they sent material, they would discreetly isolate a paragraph and mark it classified within a document. But that the formatting using the military's internet, the formatting of header and footer makes it easy and a kind of default position to classify the whole document instead of discreetly. That now the vast majority of these documents are classified in toto instead of selectively, which makes it much harder to know what's going on. Um, I don't know if that squares with, with your experience. There are some papers that are published electronically. They're only available on the classified side. But if you were to print them out, there are, I mean, it's annotated what's classified right. and what's not. So you can then share in print form, or if you want to retype, rescan, right. whatever, the everything but the classified elements. That's fine. I've had that with stuff I brought from downrange. Where right. I made sure all I had and I had embedded was the unclassified. It was printed on classified systems. The paper's not going to carry I anything. want to just point out one other use of technology of this sort, and then I want to take your question. You might find this interesting, those of you that are lawyers or aspiring lawyers. Um, one of the things that I found was related to the federal court system. 
And uh, because about a third of my book is national security, two thirds is, is um, civilian side of the equation and secrecy. And so I did a lot of interviewing in the federal court system. And one of the things I found was that they have a, um, a software system to access federal cases, civilian cases. And uh, this is the gateway for 26 million cases. Um, so as you probably know, in the federal system, the number of cases that actually go to a jury trial uh, is negligible, almost non-existent. It's 1.3%, I think, was the most recent number. And so under alternative dispute resolution, you have an awful lot of cases which are shunted through a variety of different means of resolution which produce an awful lot of sealed settlements. If you know the style, the case name of those cases that are sealed and settled, and you want to write about them or research them, you can put them into the software system that the federal court uses universally across the system. But here's what happens. If that case has been settled and sealed, it is set on a default position to spit back to the inquirer, no such case exists. Now that case does exist, but they don't want you to know what it does. And there are actually memos that I have written by those that administer the federal courts that say, we're adopting this system because we don't want to encourage press inquiries and other litigators from learning about the disposition of these cases. Now, I wouldn't call that a model of integrity and transparency on the part of the court system. That's how secrecy um, and how technology together um, can really blunt efforts at transparency. Please. Okay. I heard a lecture this summer by a lawyer at the National Counterterrorism Center, and uh, she uh, is working closely with the Director of National Intelligence. And my understanding is she's toying with the idea of getting rid of the old phrase, need to know, and moving to a different phrase. What that phrase will be uh, was of some contention. Uh, if you were an advisor for the Director of National Intelligence, what would you advise him to change that standard to be, keeping in mind that you need to protect secrets at some point, but also uh, to avoid stovepiping? The stovepiping is a term of art. It's a kind of vertical constraint um, that goes against the sharing environment um, of intelligence. Uh, need to know is a compression um, of a whole lot of very complicated standards. There is no one standard in the country. Um, in terms of classification, it varies from agency and department. I, I'm not trying to disparage your question. If, if I, what was the question? If I were the, the National Director of Intelligence and advisor, if I was, I want to think bigger, if I was the NDI, <laughs> um, I would not worry about parsing the words and the jargon. He's got a much, much bigger problem that he's facing because he's riding herd over 16 rogue agencies. They are not working together. They don't have computers that are compatible, that can talk to each other. They have different standards of clearance. The CIA still uses a lifestyle polygraph. The Defense Department a security-based polygraph. In other words, at the CIA, they ask, have you, have you been guilty of infidelity? Have you smoked dope? Blah, 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 blah. They don't ask that at the Pentagon. At the Pentagon, it's more security-related. And so they don't recognize each other's clearances. Um, they're not on the same page. Um, when the National Director of Intelligence was asked to give his assessment about how well we've done in the sharing environment. He was asked by the, the Government Accounting Office, the GAO, which is the Congressional Investigative Arm. His response was, the GAO lacks authority to inquire into intelligence matters. That does not set an example for sharing in this environment. So I think really what needs to be done from the National Director's point of view is they have to redefine the culture. They have to reward conduct that they want to promote and not just pay at lip service. So I wouldn't worry so much about the need to know. I think it has to be a lot more sophisticated and a lot more profound in terms of its impact. So anyhow, I want to thank you all very much for taking this beautiful day to share it with me. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming and Ted. Oh, goodness. Small token. Thank you. Thanks.
and Institute Fleece Pullover. I love it. I'll need it soon. <laughs> thank you. You wouldn't know it today. Oh, no. Uh, thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you very Appreciate much. It.